Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to worship on this fourth Sunday in Advent as we get ever closer to the Christmas holiday to come. Speaking of Christmas, we are going to be gathering in person for worship a couple of times during this coming week. If you'd like to join us, we'd love to host you. Christmas Eve, worshiping together at 5.30, and then Christmas Day, we get back together at 10 a.m. As always, if you prefer, we will be making these services available via two or three worship, so you can be blessed and worship with us wherever you find yourself. Just a reminder that we talked about last week, tomorrow we have a special treat. 800 years since the last time the, these planets in our solar system uh, kind of crossed paths and created what scientists and historians believe is the Bethlehem star that the wise men were able to see. Um, goes without saying, this year, 2020, we need something extra special as uh, we head into the end of the year, and we've got it. Tomorrow night is the night to go outside and take a look and uh, be able to see what the wise men purportedly saw as well. Four days before Christmas, and it is going to be quite a treat as we head into our Christmas celebration. Um, here in the Twin Cities, my understanding is we're looking at kind of partly cloudy skies, and so we should be able uh, to see that no problem. Wherever you are, take a look at the internet and uh, you'll find some instructions on where to be looking in the sky to be able to enjoy that incredible gift that God has given to us. Finally, this morning, wherever you do happen to find yourself as we head into Thursday and Friday, we here at Bethel are always privileged and glad to be able to gather with you for worship wherever we happen to be. And with that, we wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas. With that, I invite you to quiet your hearts and center your thoughts as we prepare for worship. We begin this morning as we always do in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority alone, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. And again, friends, as we close out our Advent season, our prayer of the day for this morning, as it has been the last three Sundays, is from a series of prayers that Bonhoeffer wrote to fellow prisoners while he was imprisoned at Tegel Prison during Advent and Christmas of 1943. With that, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, I praise and thank you for the peace of the night. I praise and thank you for this new day. I praise and thank you for all your goodness and faithfulness throughout my life. Amen.
Our first lesson on this fourth Sunday in Advent is found in the book of Isaiah, the 40th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she's received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice of one calling, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, and the flowers fall. But the word of our God endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson for this morning, found in the book of Romans, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 8th verse. The Apostle Paul writes, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel on this fourth Sunday in Advent, found in the book of St. John, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 33rd verse. Jesus said, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now. Where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, Jesus said, My children, I will be with you only a little longer Where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. Take a look at this building and think about what it looks like to you. How would you describe it? It's kind of a stately old looking building. It's fairly ornate, decorated, detailed, looks like an important place, looks like a stately place. In fact, this happened to be the most feared place in all of Germany during World War II. This building was called Prince Albrechtstrasse No. 8. Prince Albrechtstrasse was the main thoroughfare going throughout Berlin, and this was a building located at the heart of it, Building No. 8. And this building was the most feared building in all of Germany because it was this building which housed the feared Gestapo, the Nazi secret police. Going back to what we talked about a few weeks ago, in terms of how Bonhoeffer ended up in prison in the first place, in 1940, Bonhoeffer was was invited to join the Abwehr, that is the Nazi version of the CIA, their Nazi intelligence division, by his brother-in-law who already worked for the Abwehr. 
And what his brother-in-law wanted him to do was because Bonhoeffer had all these contacts among all these different church leaders of different nationalities around the globe, his brother-in-law thought that Bonhoeffer would be a good person to reach out to these other countries and try and find out if there was anyone interested in trying to make peace with Nazi Germany. And so in 1940, Bonhoeffer joins the Abwehr under the guise of being someone who can be useful to the Nazis because of all of his contacts in churches around the world. And he begins to try and work to find those places where there might be folks who are sympathetic to people in the Nazi government who no longer want war, who want to get rid of Hitler and want to go ahead and try to find a peaceful resolution to the war as it had already gotten going. It was on the suspicion of embezzling Abwehr funds that drew the attention of Gestapo agents to Bonhoeffer and his brother-in-law in the first place. And it was that suspicion of embezzling Abwehr funds for their own personal use that very quickly turned into a conspiracy that the Gestapo thought Bonhoeffer and his brother-in-law were involved in to smuggle Jews out of Germany. And it was that set of circumstances that landed Bonhoeffer in Tegel prison in April 1943. And as we've talked about these last several weeks, it was here that Bonhoeffer ended up languishing for about 18 months while slowly, grindingly, the Nazi government tried to build a case against Bonhoeffer, his brother-in-law, other people, to try and convict them on these embezzling charges and smuggling Jews out of Germany. But then this happened. The July 20th plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. July 20th, 1944, finally after much planning, officers in the German army, in the Abwehr, end up being able to try and make their plan a reality to assassinate Hitler. They ended up planting a bomb next to a conference table at one of his places where he would meet. The bomb detonated and somehow Hitler escaped with minor injuries. But once this happened, Hitler was bent on revenge. And Hitler was stopping at nothing to find out who it was who was responsible for all of this happening against him. And as the days and the weeks and the months began to erode, as we talked about a few weeks ago, finally a dossier of hidden paperwork was discovered. And within that dossier, Bonhoeffer's name was listed as one of the people who was involved in this plot, as well as the plot to go ahead and try and find peace. And from there, the dominoes started to fall. And after having been in this cell in Tegel prison for 18 months, in October 1944, Bonhoeffer finds himself here at the most feared building in all of Nazi Germany during World War II. Of course, it wasn't in this stately part of the building that the Gestapo had their prison. It was in this dungeonous basement on the grounds of the Gestapo headquarters that the secret police would gather up people for interrogation and hold them there. The house prison, that was the name that it was known as, suffocated all hope for those who were interned within its walls. Combined and comprised of 39 solitary cells along with one communal cell, the Gestapo would use that house prison, that small little gathering of cells, because they wanted to question people who they had, quote unquote, special interest in. And the tactic that they would use to extract information from these folks was what they called intensified interrogation. That was the language that the Nazis used for what they did to these folks that they held. You can only imagine what lengths the Nazis would go to extract the information that they were looking for. Most men who were held here 
would suffer at the hands of Nazi intensified interrogation for somewhere between several days to several months before they were shipped off to concentration camps and their ultimate destinations. What we know about Bonhoeffer at this time, from October 1944 until the end of his story, is sketchy at best. Unlike when he was at Tegel Prison, Bonhoeffer was not allowed visits from his family. He wasn't allowed to write letters or receive letters from his family and friends. Information and contact from Bonhoeffer to his family and friends was essentially cut off beginning in October 1944. Although his family was allowed to drop off a fresh laundry parcel for him every Wednesday. And what his family would do, and there were some sympathetic guards in that house prison, sympathetic to Bonhoeffer's plight, is his family would include and hide among that fresh laundry Things like scraps of bread, occasionally an apple, maybe a cigar. And when they came back and they retrieved Bonhoeffer's dirty laundry, Dietrich was able to smuggle out small scraps of paper onto which he had scratched out in pencil a few lines to try and communicate and keep his family up to date on what was going on. Beyond those few scraps of paper that we have that Bonhoeffer wrote, there were several men who were interred in the house prison during the time that Bonhoeffer was there. They survived the war and offered a testimony of what was going on and what Bonhoeffer was doing during those few months while he was there. Among those men was a guy named Fabian von Schlabrendorf, he was actually the cousin of Bonhoeffer's fiance, and he was in the house prison because like Bonhoeffer, it had been discovered that von Schlabrendorf had been involved in the July 20 plot to assassinate Hitler. And so the Nazis, the Gestapo, were extracting information from him as well as Bonhoeffer, trying to get to the bottom and find out how far this plot had gone. Bonhoeffer and von Schlabrendorf were able to have very short conversations when they would pass each other in the washroom, and they were also able to have short conversations via the space between the hinges in their cell doors. They could talk to each other in snippets based on the tiny amount of space that existed where the hinges on their cell doors didn't come exactly together. Despite the hopelessness that suffocated every person held in captivity in that place, Bonhoeffer was able to offer his, fiance, her, his fiance's cousin tidings of comfort and joy. Despite all the desperation, despite all the darkness, despite everything that surrounded Bonhoeffer and every other man held in captivity, Bonhoeffer still found some way to offer to von Schlabrendorf tidings of comfort and joy. We know that of those little gifts that his family would hide in his clean, clean laundry, Bonhoeffer would turn around and offer to von Schlabrendorf a small piece of apple. He'd offer him a shred of bread that he'd gotten, a bit of a cigar. He tried to do everything he could for von Schlabrendorf to give him something. Most importantly, von Schlabrendorf tells us that Bonhoeffer would share with him words from scripture promising comfort and hope. Von Schlabrendorf would later recall, it delighted him that even in prison you were able to help your neighbor and let him share in what you had. It may not have been much, a bit of apple, small bit of bread, little end of a cigar, words from scripture promising comfort and hope, may not have been much, 
But for Fabian von Schlabrendorf, what Bonhoeffer said, what he did, and what he offered was absolutely worth remembering and commenting about years later. As Jesus had said, where I'm going, you cannot come. And by Advent of 1944, Bonhoeffer found himself in a very similar place to what Jesus had spoken about when Bonhoeffer found himself at Prince Albrechtstrasse number eight. As Jesus had commanded, love one another, that is precisely what Bonhoeffer had done for his friend and extended family member, even in, of all places, the house prison in Gestapo headquarters. Bonhoeffer had every reason when he would receive his laundry and there was some treat hidden in it, apple, cigar, chunk of bread, to keep it for himself and enjoy it. Yet he didn't. To von Schlabrendorf, he offered love, Christ's love, through words of hope and comfort, as well as through the few small items that he had in his possession. Nothing could stop Bonhoeffer from offering his extended family member tidings of comfort and joy because nothing had stopped God from breaking into our world as we talked about last week amongst the ruins of the world. Nothing could stop God from breaking in and bringing tidings of joy or comfort through his son. And so it's no coincidence, my friends, that as we gather here in person at church on December 20th, we are going to be involved in a service project. We are going to be following Christ's command and Bonhoeffer's lead as we gather for in-person worship this Sunday. 80 men and women from a place called Volunteers of America are going to be on the receiving end as this week progresses of stockings, of small gifts that we are going to be assembling here at church on Sunday and delivering to them. These men and women have been part of our, part of our system of incarceration. They have been paroled, they've been pardoned. They're back out in society trying to rebuild their lives, having paid for the crimes that they've committed. And what we're going to do is put together stockings and gifts to be able to give to these redeemed saints during this Christmas season. A pillowcase, a pair of socks, bag of popcorn. Last Sunday, members of our congregation sat down and wrote scripture-based words of comfort and hope for these people who will receive these gifts this week. It may not be a lot. The things that we put together into these stockings and give to these saints isn't going to be a ton. But these items are being gathered, they're being prepared, and they're being gifted to these saints. These who have been previously imprisoned because nothing can still stop God from breaking into the world, into lives which have been ruined with tidings of joy or comfort by his son. To those who've often been suffocated of all hope, they have committed crimes. They have been pardoned, released, redeemed, we love them. Why, my friends? Because that's what our Lord has commanded us to do. We love because that's the witness Bonhoeffer modeled in his final days. We love because nothing has ever stopped God from breaking into our lives and the lives of these saints with tidings of comfort and joy. The Lord be with you. Amen.
this time, friends, let's confess our common Christian faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now as we approach the end of this season of Advent and prepare ourselves to joyfully celebrate the birth of our true Savior and King, let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Let's pray. Almighty God, time after time throughout history, you have worked in miraculous ways, especially during the darkest of times. As we approach the end of this Advent season, we give you thanks for the testimony and witness of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for his ironclad commitment to you alone at a time when one man was trying and in many ways succeeding in putting himself above you. We give you thanks for Pastor Bonhoeffer's assertiveness to live out the biblical principles in which he believed, even and especially when following your son ended up costing him first his freedom, then his very life. As we heard this morning, so we stand in awe and we are blessed by the testimony of Fabian von Schlabrendorf to share with us that even in his darkest hours, Bonhoeffer was still bearing faithful witness to your son's command to love. May the gifts our congregation prepares this weekend truly bless our brothers and sisters through Volunteers of America that they too may be given tidings of true comfort and joy through your son, born and really present for each of them. Father, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, before we get to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, though, we have a profound extra and special gift to relish tomorrow. In an era where we're blessed and right to lean on the gift that science is, renew in us a profound sense of wonder and awe as we go out tomorrow night to view for the first time in 800 years the star the wise men saw. For as challenging as 2020 has been in all of the ways it has been, it is not lost on us that this is the year four days before Christmas of all times, when we get the blessing of being able to witness such an astounding sight. As that star faithfully guided wise men to the side of your son, whereupon they bended a knee and worshiped him, may that same star that folks will see again tomorrow night, May it likewise guide and inspire many, many smart men and women to bow their heads and worship him as well. Despite all that Satan has done to cause us concern and harm over these past months, may you, your spirit, and your son give strength, certainty, and faith to those this Christmas who have not yet been secured by these gifts. Father, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, we pause at this time to remember a host of folks in need of your help, your healing, and your presence, including people like Jim, Bob, and Susie. We lift to you Jean and Katie, Mike, Frankie, and Faye, Chris, Lynn, as well as those we now name from the silence of our own hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, at the end of this unprecedented year, 
and as we begin to look forward to celebrating him who is timeless and familiar, absolutely welcomed traits during these challenging months of 2020. May our celebration of his birth bring us true and life-changing joy and peace, a peace which surpasses all understanding. Keep and guard our hearts in our Savior and King and give us your Holy Spirit as we offer the words that he first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and may he give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.